You don't want to directly emulate anyone because that's not who you are. You take what you like from other people, but if you try to copy someone, that's not really going to be doing the, you the best service in your career. Welcome to the Game of Her Own podcast, your go-to place for empowering behind-the-scenes stories of trailblazing women who work in the sports and event industry. I'm your host, Jahan Blake, and I'm honored to bring you this free resource where you'll hear firsthand accounts of how these incredible women got their seat at the table. And I will personally share your strategies to help develop your leadership skills in this industry. We've got a lot to explore together. I am so glad you're here. All right, Game of Her Own listeners, let's do this. Kim, welcome to the Game of Her Own podcast. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to, to chat. Okay, Kim, so you are currently Chief of Staff and Chief Legal Officer for the National Women's Soccer League, Boston. And before that, you were with the Red Sox, Pawtucket Red Sox, now Worcester Red Sox. You were also with them. You were at Wilmer Hale, went to Harvard Law. I got like really excited when I was doing my homework. I was like, oh my God, Kim is such a badass. Tufts undergrad. So along that entire journey to get where you are now, What's one piece of advice you wish you had received, let's say earlier in your career? Especially early in my career, I would I wish someone had told me, don't doubt the vision or plan that you have for yourself. I had a pretty clear one and I thought that was strange and that I should, I maybe I shouldn't have such a clear vision for what I wanted to do. And I, I wish someone had told me, no, that's fine. Just keep keep going with that. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but you know, you knew what you wanted to do and how you were going to get there. Is that right? I didn't know how I would get there, but I had okay. a, I had a thought as to how I would get there. But I did I did sort of know what I wanted to do, which is I think not the case for the majority of people, and is probably like very oldest daughter of me to be like I had a plan and I knew exactly what I wanted, <laughs> um, but I kind of did, but no one else that I knew did. So I just thought I was strange for that. I wish someone had said no. That's good. Like stay with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So no one talked you out of it. It was more the influence of just hearing what others had to say, like about their own journey and like just not knowing what they wanted. Yeah. Well, and you know that getting into sports, no one comes at it from the same direction um, mm -hmm. and everyone takes a different path to get there. And so hearing everyone's stories can be very helpful because you realize that you can come from any sort of background and get into sports. But on the other hand, it's hard to envision what your own path would look like. And I think for me, that comparison or the comparison about what maybe people I worked with or came across and how they sort of went about creating their sports career, I think I overthought it and thought, you know, well, what are they doing that I need to be doing? You know, oh, I'm not tracking exactly how they are. And so I think it created self-doubt where it really should have just been, okay, great. They're taking a path. There's a lot of paths. I have a pretty good vision for what I want mine to be. Mm -hmm. So I do think that comparison is really, can be good, but can also create some of that doubt, which is definitely good for me. You know, I agree. I always say comparison is the thief of joy. But then mm, there's yeah. also this like side of it where it's like, well, I'm competitive. I'm an athlete. And although when I ran up the stairs yesterday, I didn't feel like an athlete anymore. <laughs> but I'm going to say once an athlete. No, you're still an athlete. You're still yes, an athlete. Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. But the competitive side of, uh, side of me, like sometimes enjoys the comparison game. Like it's a hard balance to follow because it definitely does steal my joy when I compare myself. And I'm like, oh, look what she's doing. Look what he's doing. Yep. But the same, and like, but also sometimes it'll motivate me. It's it's hard to balance those two. Yeah, I wish that there you could kind of keep yourself in a sweet spot where you can look around, use the motivation, educate yourself on what people are doing, but also have the confidence that your own path is just right the way it is. Um, and I I don't think I, I think you're right that um, being an athlete and being someone who is wired pretty competitively, I don't think I strike that balance all that well. I think I probably like overcorrect and I go too competitive and then I switch myself back. So I think it for me, I tend to sort of bounce back and forth between those. Um, and when I was younger and early in my career, I think I did a lot more of the competing just because it felt then like I had a way to measure myself, but I don't know that it actually got me anywhere. What really resonates with me is the about, like kind of course correcting, bouncing back and forth. And like, I would tend to 
you know, if I'm being too competitive and it's really like impacting me and my self-doubt, right? That's something that I'm in anxiety. That's something I always deal with. I would, you know, overcompensate on the other side. And, you know, sometimes I'd be too laid back and I'm like, nope, that's not it. And then I'd be too competitive. Nope, that's not it. Like, it's just, okay, I'm not gonna, you know, follow these people on like LinkedIn or social anymore because I'm feeling, you know, it's just, I'm seeing them all the time. Nope, that's not it. That's not the answer. Hiding from it isn't the answer either. I think there's a lot more course correcting. And I wish I, on the one hand, I wish I were wired differently. And it sounds like we're kind of the same where I could just sort of, sit and cruise a little bit, but, uh, you can only fight what you're like for so long. Um, and so you just have to work with it. And so I think, you know, embracing that and sort of the way that you're on intrinsically wired, I think is really good, but also kind of like you calling your list of who you're following on social media or LinkedIn. I think a lot of it is also who are you surrounding yourself with? And is it people who make you feel like you should be even more competitive or performative, or is it people who let you chill out and be sort of sure of yourself and a little bit less prone to measuring yourself and what you're doing to those around you. So I try really hard to surround myself with people like that. You know, if I'm around a lot of competitive people, I'm just going to keep getting more and more competitive. And I don't think that that's healthy for me and it's not what I want for me. Tell us how you deal with, so I understand how you manage that. How do you manage, I mean, your career and listeners, you can find her entire bio in the show notes, but your entire career like is very impressive and your education is very impressive in terms of like where you went. Yes. And like how you graduated and the levels that you graduated. For me, it's like outside looking in. Really? You like dealt with self-doubt? Like no way. Like how is that? Right. Cause you see like somebody, oh, they went to Harvard law, law and then They've been practicing and they've always been in the legal space in sports. So you can't imagine, like, it's hard to imagine that you would deal with something like self-doubt. So you said that before. So tell us how you manage to kind of pull yourself out. And that's interesting because I've, right. I mean, it's just the way that I guess I think, but I, I, I do, yes, deal with self-doubt, but also just deal with a lot of like overthinking is what I'm prone to, right? It, you know, that's just sort of the way I am. And I think. Those traits serve me really, really well uh, as a student and have now served me really well as a lawyer and as a professional, but you can get carried away with them in a way that is not healthy. I think that's sort of how it trends for me. I think I spent a lot of my 20s in particular figuring this out. I mean, I, I mean I'm mean, i still figuring it out, but I think I spent a lot of my 20s figuring out that letting some of the self-doubt maybe stop me from jumping at opportunities or from trusting myself that it didn't, that it just didn't serve me very well. And thankfully I had really good people around me to say, you know, trust yourself, trust your gut, take a risk. I'm not naturally a risk taker, but take a risk. What's the worst that can happen? And so I think that having some people around me to, to make me feel like it was safe to push myself and remind me that why I was doing it, which was I had this very clear vision in mind for sort of what I wanted from the start of my career and bringing me back to that, I think was very helpful to sort of keep me focused and and not get distracted by what other people are doing or, you know, where I think I should be at. Um, It's just, it's a big waste of mental and emotional energy, but it took me a long time to figure that out. You figure it out. And then I don't know about you, but I, sometimes I figure it out and then I lose sight of it. Oh, all the time. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you figured it out and you had the secret sauce equation, like you knew what to do. And all of a sudden it's like, I wake up one day, I'm like, wait, how did I get back here? <laughs> I thought I already checked this box and fixed this problem. But at least you know it, right? And you probably know how you got yourself out of that la- the last few times. And so yes. hopefully you spot it earlier and you can kind of coach yourself through it faster. Because I don't know, I think the way I think about it just for myself is that yeah, you can't fight sort of the way that you work, your nature, your tendencies. It's just, you can recognize it faster and sort of move on more quickly, yeah. you know? So it's, I focus more on that because I don't know, I don't think I'll ever change the way that my my brain works or any of that. It's just not happening. So instead it's, what do you kind of do with it? Yeah. Yeah. I love that thought of just like, okay, accepting who you are it's not healthy to fight it. Like it's just, it, it, nothing good is going to come of it. Like you just, you never feel good when you try to like change who you, who you are to kind of mm-hmm. 
survive, and that might be too strong of a word, but to, you know, or thrive in the situation that you're in professionally or personally, really. Like, it's just, I know from my personal experience and I know from my clients' experiences, like, it never works. You cannot last. And that's where burnout and exhaustion and you just almost want to like give up at that point if you go down that route of trying to quiet yourself or tame yourself is a better word. No, that's a great way of describing it. And right. And if you do that to get ahead professionally, you sort of find yourself in a situation where you have to keep living up to that sort of way that isn't natural to you. And yeah, you're going to burn out. You're just, you're, and, and you're probably not being the best at whatever you're doing um, that you could be because you're not, you know, taking advantage of your natural talents and, you know, the way that you are and all of that. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think that's where, especially as a young person coming into sports or just professionally, generally, you don't want to directly emulate anyone because that's not who you are. You take what you like from other people, but if you try to copy someone, that's not really going to be doing the, you the best service in your career. Um, and I mean, I only know that because I tried that on, right? Of course, I tried that in yes. my 20s and here and there and realized, oh, that's that doesn't, I can't do that. That's not sustainable. That I'm not good at being that other person. So let me give up on that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly. I was literally going to ask you, I'm like, wait, how do you, how do you know that? Cause I know how I know that. And it's just oh, from living it. Oh, I did just... it a bunch of times. Like, yeah, just finding people, especially, I don't know. Mm-hmm. You see a really impressive woman working in sports. You're like, I want to be like her, but you're not, you're different. You have your own strengths. And so, oh, but I only know that because I tried and, <laughs> and it didn't, and it, it didn't last. So I, I have been there too. And I'm like having flashbacks. I was like, oh yeah, yeah. It like just never worked. And like, sometimes you don't, at least for me, I didn't earlier in my career or in life, like I just, I was like, why isn't this working? Like, why can't I do things the way she does things? Because that was me. I was always like, who are the women who work in sports? Who are the women who are advancing and leveling up? And there wasn't a lot of us 20 years ago when I started. So I was like, oh, I want to be like my boss, Sarah McKenna, who we were just talking about. Like, I want to be like, oh, Mercita Thompson. She's another, you know, director level in sports. Okay, got it. Like, ready. Okay, I'm going to be like them. When I did, it never, whether it was positive or negative, Mm-hmm. Like it, it never felt right. Like I was like, oh, I just copied what Sarah did and I got praise. I just copied what Sarah did and I got in trouble. <laughs> like, <laughs> or I like didn't really understand how I got to where I was. You know what I mean? Like it just didn't. Yeah. Like this, isn't, like this isn't me. This doesn't make any sense. I'm missing. I was robbing myself of just like, like real true experience and like critical thinking and that experience of just almost having like a real true pit in your stomach. You came up with an idea And you're doing it your way and you have influences from other people, but like totally owning it as like something you wanted to do. It never landed well. No. And it's so hard to have someone else tell you all this and actually get it and believe it. I I don't know. I think even like if you're list, if someone's listening to this and they want to try to act on it, they might have to go through the same stuff that you and I are describing because you have to learn yourself. Um, yes. And so sometimes that's just like a necessary step of the process, which can be so frustrating, but, but we like, we both learned from it and I don't know, we, we both are better for it. So I do think it, that's one of those things that is really hard to get without going through it firsthand and, and realizing, oh no, I can't be anybody else. That doesn't work. Speaking of just living it and having that lived experience, talk to us about navigating internal politics or conflict with coworkers. Like I will coach and do podcasts on it. And sometimes I'm like, all right, you got to, you just got to go deal with it. Like you got to, you got to try and you may fail. I have given you all the resources, but like just sitting here waiting, isn't going to work. So you got to get in there and do it. Like talk about your experience in that area. I think in some ways it's actually parallel to what we were just describing in that. I think I tried on a lot of different styles for size to see what worked for me. I think, I mean, I grew up in a family that was very conflict avoidant and you just hold everything inside and you just, you, you don't actually fight about things. And so I think I learned that, but then I also went to law school and while I'm not a litigator, I got much more comfortable with conflict and, um, you know, hashing something out respectfully and professionally, but, you know, having a difference of opinion and really talking it through and that being 
a good, healthy thing to do. And so I think I, you know, I had two sort of different sides of the spectrum that way. And then when I got into, you know, my own career, I think that for a little while I tried one approach or another. I tried being, you know, more active when there was a conflict either with another coworker, which thankfully isn't much, but, you know, watching, watching people have conflicts at work and whether you get involved or whether you try to try to be the peacemaker or whether you just stay out of it. I think I tried on a lot of different approaches, just trying to sort of figure out what served me best, what it took me a little bit to figure out, but I observed mainly in some really awesome women around me, a couple of, of men too, but was just the power that comes with always keeping your cool and never, never acting or saying something in, when you're just in the heat of any sort of emotion. And that's so much easier said than done. But watching people do that successfully is so inspiring because they just there's so much power in that. In sports, especially, but this is true probably anywhere, you're all like repeat players. You all have a relationship and you're going to work together again and again and again, even if you don't know how, but your paths are going to cross again later. And so handling yourself in a way that you can be proud of and that where you can see the person again tomorrow or in five years and feel good about how you conducted yourself. That really matters too. And that stuck with me as I've seen how small this world is that, you know, you want to be really thoughtful about how you are carrying yourself out around anybody else. So that, that too, though, is like, I try, I overcorrected. I tried different styles and then I finally Mm -hmm. figured out what seemed most effective to me. And that's a lot of, you know, trying really hard to always be the one in the room who can keep their cool, who can suggest a timeout if it's needed, who can bridge the gap. I think there's a lot of power in being that person. And I really want to be the person that my coworkers can trust and rely on to stay cool and calm and objective, even when there's Mm -hmm. a disagreement about something. Yes. There's so much, there's so much power in that and being that person. Yeah. How did you become, you said you, you know, became comfortable with conflict. I mean, I feel like everyone's just like, how'd you do that? (laughs) That is a difficult thing to do. So tell us, like, how did you, what's the secret sauce there? There's no secret sauce other than you could go to law school, (laughs) although you could also just be really uncomfortable in law school um, the whole time. So that probably doesn't work for everybody. One angle is you find yourself a really great partner like I have in my husband who has helped me learn that. I mean, his his family, his from what I described in my household growing up, his was very different in that respect. They would actually hash things out. They would air out frustrations. There was very little that would sort of stay under the surface. And so I got to watch how he does that with his family and us talking about it amongst ourselves and how we want our household to be. And I got to see that, you know, when you air out differences, it it doesn't kill the relationship. It doesn't mean that there's something, you know, horribly, horribly wrong. It's just something that you do and that happens. And that happens. That's true at the workplace, too. You know, you can love a coworker and still disagree with them or, you know, have a strong difference of opinions. And you can work through it and it doesn't mean anything negative at all about the relationship or the effectiveness of that partnership. Neither of those are probably all that useful because those are going to law school and finding a really good partner, partly luck, partly just, you know, I feel very lucky that my husband is very intelligent in those ways and has, you know, we've learned a lot together. But I do think part of it too is just finding good people to observe who you can watch Mm -hmm. navigate a disagreement or a conflict and saying, oh, I really respect the way that they're handling that. When I started at the Pawtucket Red Sox, the gentleman who was the vice chairman at that time, but the former president of the team, Mike Tamburo, had been in that role for decades. He has such a calm affect about himself. And yet when people are having a disagreement, and we went through a lot with Rhode Island politics and all of this when we were trying to build our stadium in Rhode Island, He held so much power in his ability to tell someone he disagreed with them respectfully and nicely. Everyone loves him. No one has a bad thing to say about him, but he did not agree with everyone. And he he had arguments and he 
um, had tough discussions. And so I felt very lucky that early in my career, I got to watch that and say, oh, I really respect how he's doing that. I, I want to take some flavors of that and try to, you know, kind of make that my own because I think that there's something really effective in how he's approaching conflict. So it was, I mean, it was also just witnessing that firsthand. Hmm. Yeah, I, I feel like the theme in just everything you do is like, you're not going at it alone. And, uh, yeah. you know, for conflict, you're observe it, law school. Okay, yes, right. But, right, people are listening like, I'm not going to law school. So yeah, it's just right. like- Don't go to law school just for that, no. Way too <laughs> I mean, expensive for that. Yes. And they might be thinking, yeah, my husband doesn't like conflict, so, or my partner yeah. doesn't like conflict, so that's <laughs> out too. So now it becomes like, okay, but what else? And I hear not going at it alone, communication when so when you do see somebody who is mm-hmm. handling conflict in a way that you were like oh I wish I could do that well talk about it sort of how you talked about it with your husband like oh yeah I I, I don't know what the conversations were but like you, you know what I mean? like you picked up on what was going on and then you had conversations about it um to yeah. understand because we my family is <laughs> we're like your family and my husband's yeah. family is like your family and so <laughs> I'm just like all right well we, we gotta we gotta figure out how to deal with this right like yeah. <laughs> it is about just seeing other people saying something or watching and just taking note and figure out how you can incorporate that into your way of doing things yeah totally that's funny mm-hmm. I hadn't thought about that theme but you're right and it is a lot about looking out for people who who are handling themselves or doing things in a way that you respect and want to emulate. I guess that's partly, I, I don't know that I've ever consciously thought of it, but I guess I do a lot of that, you know, and like what I was describing with Mike Tamburo, we would, I'd watch him have a really tough conversation. And then I would go to his office after and be like, Hey, can we just talk? Like, I thought that was really interesting. Or I thought that was a great thing that you did when you pivoted the conversation in this way. Let's just talk about it. And he was really generous with his time and, you know, but I mean, I try, those are some of the most educational conversations I've ever had were just with him debriefing situations that we were both present for. And so, I mean, I think that type of stuff too, there's nothing formal. I just went into his office and said, yes. mm-hmm. let's just talk about it. Like, Hey, and I mean, he, I mean, I think he would tell you, he wanted to do it too. We both just processed this intense conversation it's really nice to talk to someone about that yeah. and like how it went. And it's good for both of you to do that. And it's funny, like, I think I took those for granted, but looking back, I learned so much from those conversations that I will carry with me in my personal life and my professional life forever. You know, yeah. and I, didn't, I didn't seek that. I didn't intentionally, there was no plan to do that. One thing that you said was it was good for him to talk about it as well. Yeah. So even if you just, like I overheard a client we were all in the same room and she had a conversation with her, you know, somebody who reported in directly to her and I could hear it. And I, I just, as a coach, I couldn't help but listen. And like, there was nowhere I could go. So I was just yeah. like, well, I'm, I'm, I can hear it. And so the way she handled it was so, like, I was like, that was amazing. And so after, you know, the employee left the room, I like went over, I was like, that was really well done. Like not a lot of managers know how to handle that situation. And I was like, I just, I hope I'm not overstepping here. And she was like, was it? I didn't even know. Like, I was like, yes, wow. it was so good. Yeah. Like, but like we started to talk about it and yeah. like the value in what she did. Um, and she was like, oh, okay. And like, it, it felt good for her to like even yeah. talk about it. Cause she wasn't sure either, you know? That's so cool. Right. Cause you yeah. assume, you assume, of course she knows that she's did amazing in that conversation. Yeah. And you actually find out that, oh, she needed that reassurance or Mm -hmm. it was actually, it wasn't just self-serving for you to, you know, someone in in a junior position to go up and say, oh, I I appreciated how you did that, but actually it was good for that other person too, to hear that. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I I almost didn't say something. So I was like, I feel like I'm overstepping. Like I should mind my business. And right. It totally wasn't like it was a great discussion for both of us. And I was like, all right. And like, and I kind of get, get to put that in my toolbox too. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah, that was a great way of doing things. For sure. That's cool. That's really cool. She she probably like kept that with her for a while. Yeah. It was just now, a, a thought. Yeah, ex- exactly. And I like, it's like, I'm just going to, I'm going to share it. What, what's the worst that can happen? We're already working together. So <laughs> <She's> yeah. like, <laughs> we're in the middle of the project. So I might as well say, <laughs> I, I can say something. Yeah. It's It's fine. Hey, Game of Thrones listeners, Jahan popping in here. Do you ever feel overlooked at work? 
or perhaps unsure how to advocate for yourself, you are not alone. And it's exactly why I've created a free training called Empower Your Career, Mastering the Art of Self-Advocacy for Promotion and Raises. In this training, I will teach you tactics like how to have meaningful interactions with your leadership team, how to increase your confidence, and there's so much more. You'll walk away with the tools to confidently seize control of your career growth. So what do you think? Are you ready to stop being overlooked and start being noticed? If you are, the link to sign up is in the show notes. Let's elevate your career together. All right, let's get back to the episode. Talk a little bit. I I think listeners would be curious to know, just, you know, we always talk about women working in sports and how it can be difficult. You know, it's male dominated and, you know, I, I know every team is different. Right. So it's a blanket statement, but every team is different. But being in the legal industry, the legal side of it, like talk to us about what that what your experience has been like. I didn't know this up front, but I I realized somewhere along the way, probably while I was in law school, that having a legal background, probably true for other grad degrees it does equalize things in some ways i felt like what i saw was that there were more uh senior women in legal capacities than maybe what i was seeing at the time in business and other sort of capacities and so it seemed like if you have a law degree it's like another stamp of approval it kind of can elevate you and and it can overcome some of the challenges sometimes that as a woman getting into sports you can have it doesn't like solve everything, but it can help a little bit with that. And so, I mean, we've seen there's lots of in sports, it's still very male dominated, but there are a ton of female lawyers in sports. And I feel like there's so many in sports teams where the legal department is predominantly female and that's, and it's like been that way. And so I think it speaks to, of course, women are more than capable of doing these jobs, but also when you maybe buy into that very quickly because you're like, oh, they have a JD, they went to a good school, whatever, and give them those opportunities, they'll thrive. And so I thought, I I didn't know that going in, but once I got into it, I realized, oh, this is a really great way to sort of feel like maybe I can take down a few barriers as a woman getting into sports. And then I think that, you know, part, there's two sides to, there's multiple sides to being a lawyer for a sports team. One of them is advising your client, which is the team, the owner, whomever, you know, you're reporting to directly. I feel like that I haven't noticed a whole lot in terms of, um, personally, I've not noticed a lot of bias, but I think that's also because hopefully your owner hires you. And so they hire you because they you, mm-hmm. they think you're good and they they trust you. They want your input. But there's also the external side where maybe you're negotiating a contract with somebody else or you're resolving a dispute with somebody else. And I do still sometimes think that there's bias because it's, oh, you're a female representing a sports team and you know, you're a young female representing a sports team. I think there's a little skepticism at the start sometimes. I'm a little used to it. I I don't really pay attention to it anymore. I did a lot more when I was younger, just because, you know, I was very hyper aware of it. Now I just don't pay attention. I just get right to the business at hand and we just move on. And so I think some of it is, I guess I was, I had the luxury of being able to try to look past some of that. But I think it's also just having the confidence to know that as time goes on, your work and your skills will sort of prove themselves for you. The fact that you should be there and you should be in that room having those conversations, no matter what your gender identity is, will come out and you don't need Mm. to prove yourself. You don't need to come on really strong right at the beginning to be like, I'm really smart and you should respect me. You just, you just do your thing. Um, and people can figure that out. And that took me, I overcorrected for that in my twenties too. I think I came on too strong at the beginning in my twenties sometimes, because I felt like how else is someone going to respect me? I'm a young woman in this big role, I need to like over sort of play my character um, to command respect. And turns out I didn't actually have to do that. Yeah. I I feel like that was like a mini like masterclass on (laughs) navigating, like being, you know, working in a male dominated industry because sometimes, and I want to say this gracefully, but sometimes I'm like, oh, we always keep talking about it's, you know, male dominated, male dominated. And I, I think it's a great conversation to have. But we also, I think there's value in also when you're trying to show up at work 
and show up in your career, like sometimes not paying attention to it, if you have that luxury, right? Yeah. Like is, is really valuable. Like it, it, not worrying about showing up. So, you know, men respect you, like showing up how you yeah. want to show up. And like you said, simply said, doing your thing, like you do you. And then yeah. there'll be a time that you may have to have some you know, difficult conversations with people because they are not treating you fairly and, and whatnot. And that, that list can go you know on for a really long time, unfortunately. But I, I do feel like when you stop, I don't know, showing up and reacting to that narrative, right? And you don't even know in your office, like, is it that, is it, is it that bad? Right. And you start like a new place. It's like, oh, like, let's just give everyone a chance. You do you, you show up as you, and then- you kind of fight the battles as you need to. Yes, that is the, that's the way that you should do it. That's the way that I wish I had done it from the start. Yeah. But you learn, like you learn the hard way. Yep, same, um, same. But I think I wasted so much energy and thought and focus on some of that stuff at the beginning yes. when, yeah. because I assumed that people would think less of me and, and plenty of people have because I'm a young woman in sports, but I don't think I really needed to spend that time or energy thinking about that. I'm not sure that it helped me to do that. Mm -hmm. And it certainly was time and energy I could have put somewhere else. And like, and, and I mean, it's not fair to, you know, I've had so many awesome male coworkers who have surprised me by how wonderfully supportive and great they are. And I don't want to come at anyone with these preconceived notions. I don't want people to come at me with them either. So I think you're, I think you're totally right that if you can do it, it's, you come in kind of neutral and mm -hmm. when you're pleasantly surprised, that's great. And when you're, you know, surprised and not yes. in a good way, you deal with it. That too, I only learned through experience. So if someone can actually skip those steps and just like embrace that, they, they'll be off to a really good start, but I couldn't, I mean, I, I had to learn a little bit myself. Yeah. Yeah. I'm right. I definitely, the, what I just said was not how I felt 20, yeah. you know what I mean? Even 15 you years ago. So advanced. Like, <laughs> yes. yes. I wish I, I wish <laughs> I had that advice. Okay. Before we get to the final sprint, final five yeah. questions that are really easy. Um, well, I shouldn't say they're easy, but they're meant to be quick in your yeah. role. And, you know, it's just, it's so exciting to see the the soccer coming back to, you know, Boston and, and women's soccer. Like, it's so exciting. So maybe yeah. you can spend a couple of minutes just talking about how you're feeling about it and like what's to come. This episode will end, we're in December now, but this will air in January. So it'd be mm -hmm. great to hear your just, just how you're feeling right now about it. Yeah. I mean, I think, and I hope that people listening also feel sort of the excitement that I think so many people feel about the trend of women's sports generally right now mm -hmm. um, in the fact that we're seeing all over the place in so many different ways that investment in women's sports is proving that people like it as a product, that people want to watch it, that it can be really captivating and entertaining. And so it's, I'm really thrilled to be in women's sports at a time when that's happening and proving itself. I mean, we're getting like new viewership um, ratings all the time and good numbers and people following female athletes in all sorts of sports and, and, you know, young boys looking up to them just like they would look up to a male athlete, like just so much good stuff happening in women's sports right now. So I'm really happy to be part of that and to be able to do it in my home area is just the best, right? I mean, that's kind of, yeah. I I wanted to work in women's sports. And when this club came and got the bid from the National Women's Soccer League to launch a team in Boston, and we won't, we're going to start playing in 2026, I was just over the moon and just wanted to sort of be able to throw my weight behind it in whatever way I could because I wanted mm -hmm. to succeed. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm just feeling so excited about that. And, you know, I think our attitude is very much that, Boston, and you, you know this, Boston fans have very high expectations, and we want them to have those for us as a female team. And we also want to deliver a product that is sort of up to the standard that our Boston fans are, are used to. And we'll do some things differently, too, right? Well, that's yeah, sort of yeah. that's part of the fun of it, too, is we will also do, we won't just do things the way that they're always done. I think, you know, for me, I'm, we're two years out from playing, so we have the luxury of some time to get to know our future fan base really, really well and listen to them. And I'm going back to my ambassador days a little bit because yes. I'm going to be doing a lot of like interacting with our fans and listening to the public and taking all of that and incorporating it into what we're doing. 
which I think is going to be key to having a successful club. But it's cool to be part of an ownership group that is all female led and that is so engaged with the community from the very, very, very beginning. I feel very lucky to be in that spot. Mm. Well, congratulations. It sounds Thank really you. exciting. Thank you. Final five questions. Uh, first thing that kind of comes to your mind, what's a goal you achieved that initially you weren't sure you could reach? Having, um, this, this is like superficial kind of, having an office to myself at a sports stadium. Just the fact that like, it's cool because you work in sports. I always wanted to do that. I was in a cubicle. That was great. But then I finally got my own office with a door and it was mine and it had a nameplate. I kind of dreamed of that back at the beginning of my fan, Fenway Ambassador days. And so yeah. to have gotten that, I, I was felt a little bit of like pinch me. So that was cool. Yes. yes. They literally, I was like, oh my God, I'm not. Like one day, I wonder if I'll ever get an office. I know that feeling so, so I just got like the chills. Like I know it's not like, it does feel superficial, but it's so, there's so much meaning. Behind it means it. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, I have a exactly. picture of me in, uh, in Larry Lucchino's office at Fenway that I took that, that someone took of me being like, this is your dream, Kim, one day. And so, <laughs> yeah, it, there's a lot of more meaning behind it. And for those of you who don't know the Red Sox as well as we do, uh, Larry Lucchino is the former Red Sox president. Yes. All right. So what is your go-to pump-up song? Uh, changes all the time based on my mood. I have been listening to a lot of Olivia Rodrigo lately, so I'm actually going to say um, Get Him Back is one of her new songs I'm really enjoying. Mm, she's fantastic. She's so right. good. She's really yeah. good on SNL. I, I'm a I'm really big fan. Uh, what's your favorite way to unwind after a long, busy day? Reality television and painting my nails. Mm, like what's your yes, favorite reality set. TV show? Currently, I've been watching Married at First Sight. <laughs> I have never seen that. That is fantastic. <laughs> I, I love it. My husband loves it. We are currently watching the latest Australian season and it's really good. <laughs> nice, nice. We're big Love is Blind fans. Like, also we, that. like watch it and like... Like, we just feel a little like, really, is this what we're watching as adults? But I, I love it. I can't help it's myself. Just, it's a little, it's, it is reality television, but it's kind of escapist too. And I think that's what helps me unwind when I've had an intense day. Mm -hmm. Yes. What's one thing that always makes you laugh out loud? Um, my nephew. I have a two-year-old nephew who is like a big chaotic ball of energy and never stops doing absolutely crazy things. Um, and so I'll FaceTime or visit him and I just don't stop laughing. So <laughs> I know that as well. Yeah. Uh, all right. Last one. Name one woman in sports who inspires you and share why. I will say a name that is also familiar to people in baseball or familiar with the Red Sox or the Dodgers, um, Janet Murray Smith. Um, and I'll say her because I have had the privilege of working closely with her, but she was one of the first women I saw in a room full of men who you just knew from the start carried so much respect and credibility and people listened to her without raising her voice, any of that. And I just, I have so much respect for her and the way that she just does her thing. And I, she's, she's a great mentor, but she's also just someone you want to sit in the room, the back of the room and just watch her go. She's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and for those of you who haven't listened, I got the honor. I had the honor of interviewing Janet Marie Smith. So I will link to that episode in the show notes as well. Um, Kim, this has been so much fun. I love talking to you. I wish I lived in Boston because I feel like we'd be really good friends. Uh, yeah, so you can come back anytime. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if someone wanted to get in touch with you, how would they go about doing that? Uh, find me on LinkedIn um, and send me a message is probably the best way to do it. So yeah. and I'd love to chat. Fantastic. Thank you so much for dedicating your donating your time to share your journey with us. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for hosting these. I have learned so much listening and it was really fun to to chat. And when you come out to Boston, we'll grab we'll grab drinks or uh, we'll get you to a game eventually too. Yes. All right, ladies, now it's your turn. I want you to take action on what you heard today. Kim and I talked about a lot in this episode. I have two things that I want to recommend you adopt as your own uh, to make a difference in your career almost immediately. The first one, embrace your true self, the power of authenticity. Kim said something powerful about this. She said you can't fight who you are. Now, trust me, it is tempting to look at successful people in your field and think, I want to be 
like them. I guess that means I should act and show up just like them. But here's the thing. There's absolutely zero value in showing up as anyone but yourself. I get it. Stepping out as your true self can feel a bit daunting sometimes. But guess what? You were hired for a reason, my friend. You bring a unique perspective and a set of skills to the table. Picture this. A company filled with clones, people who all think and act the same. Boring, right? So I want you to do me a favor. Actually, scratch that. I want you to do yourself a favor. Show up as you and only you. Embrace your quirks, your strengths, and your authentic voice. And when the urge to conform creeps in, pause and get curious. Why do you feel that way? Take a moment to sit with it and explore any insecurities that might be hiding beneath the surface. This is your chance to strengthen those areas and let your confidence come through. Remember, my friend, embracing your true self is the key to unlocking your full potential. So let's break free from the mold and make some magic happen. The second key takeaway is that failure is a stepping stone to success. We've all been there. Failing can sting. And I'll admit, it hits me hard too. Sometimes bouncing back feels like a slow and challenging process. But guess what? Within every failure lies this treasure trove of lessons. Yes, my friends, every single failure has key learnings baked right in. Take a moment to let that sink in. Each setback is an opportunity for growth and development. So after you pick yourself up and dust yourself off, take a deep breath. Now, instead of dwelling on what went wrong, get curious about what happened. What can you learn from this experience? Your failures are not roadblocks. They are stepping stones to your success. Embrace them as valuable teachers and let them strengthen your confidence, resilience, and determination. Trust me, when you look back at all the missteps, all the failures that you've overcome, you'll realize just how far you've come along your journey. And don't forget, I need you to keep this in mind. Every one fails. Literally everyone. It's inevitable. All right, Game of Rome listeners, it is time to unleash your authentic self and see the beauty in all the different failures. Until next week, my friends, in the meantime, it's your turn. Go out and take some action.